Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast today. Welcome to the yoga and, and meditation channel of the podcast. On the show today, we have Julia Johansson, a German a yoga teacher and embodiment coach, uh, or you might pronounce it as Julia Johansson. Uh, she's a, a really lovely person. I know from meeting her personally and doing a little bit of work with her in, in the embodiment circles at one point. And uh, uh, we've also been on the Embodied Facilitator course together, which is a while ago now. And Julia has uh, some great specialisms uh, that really link yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and embodiment. Uh, she's into laughter yoga, nature connection. Uh, she has her own podcast, uh, which she started last year, I think. I'll ask her more about that. Uh, yeah, she's particularly interested in working with and researching body landscapes, relationships, uh, written words and languages that have no words, she says on her website. So I think she's a bit of a German romantic poet, perhaps, as well. So I can't wait uh, to find out more. And uh, I'm going to start by asking Julia what got her into embodiment and yoga and all this wonderful stuff that we're both into and that this, this podcast is about. Hello, Karen, first of all. <laughs> it's a pleasure oh, to be here. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, this journey started very early. Like as a young girl, I was really interested in finding out what's the sense of life. So I was really thinking about these topics and um, writing and reading was as soon as, as could uh, read. I was reading books a lot and writing about psychology and philosophy. And uh, then I, I figured out that I like, love to dance also. Like in the sports class, uh, the teachers told me, you better go to a dancing class because the usual sport is maybe not so good for you. <laughs> and the dance was like, ah, this, this being in the body. So dance and writing and reading, uh, this was where it all started. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Because quite often um, uh, the guests on the podcast have come into, into it from a, kind of healing modality, you know, being uh, ill in some way and looking for things that would make them feel better. And uh, it's not, not so common that people come from, from this creative philosophical inquiry. Yeah, it was this, but the same time also it came from a suffering as well, searching these questions. Mm, yeah. I was depressed and not in a good state. And I wanted to understand this. So mm -hmm. I started a therapy when I was 20, so very young, to, yeah, to clear this and find out and combined with this love for poetry and uh, yeah, with everything. Yeah, and you, you talk and write about the, the languages that have no words or the, the poetry of the body and I often find in, in my work as, as a yoga teacher which which you teach as well and that kind of so much it's so much more than than postures that it, it can be really hard to describe some of these experiences of the body um, using ordinary language and so how uh, did you find this exploration in, in language and poetry helped you understand the body and embodiment? So this was actually very important for me because I was very shy when I was a girl. So I didn't talk in school because I was just shy. And through this poetry or the writing, writing poetry or stories, 
it is for me also like another language. And also the body dancing was for me in, in a way to express myself. Mm. And people told me when they saw me dancing, they were surprised because they saw another side of me because I was dancing really wild and expressive and I had no problem to dance in front of a group alone, but I couldn't speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so something about expression and I think in, in embodied yoga, um, I often talk about this uh, with, with, uh, with uh, colleagues. Um, in, in kind of regular yoga, the expression of the body can be fairly, I, I think fairly limited because yoga has these specific poses, specific practices. So versus poetry or dance, uh, it can seem a lot less expressive and we do it on our own on the mat uh, often we do it on our own obviously we might be in a group but everyone's on their own mat there's less kind of interaction and expressiveness we might associate with with yoga than with dance so how did you find uh, bringing some of that into your yoga practice how did that come about moving from dance and expressiveness to yoga so yeah later on this journey like after my therapy where i found i understand everything now rational but still there is a point where i uh, where i'm stuck <clears throat> and through yoga and the body work i came deeper to have deeper clearings or or trauma release and then the yoga came to me where in yoga came together the philosophy and the physical and uh, first of all, yoga gave me, I learned through yoga discipline and the form, because I was a very fluid person. <laughs> like, <clears throat> and then by time it came together, the yoga and the, and the dance. So all the fluid yoga, but yoga gave me a lot of like, yeah, form and discipline for my life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in embodiment, we often recognize this uh, distinction between form-based practice and freedom practices. So um, yoga and martial arts being generally much more form-based, you follow specific uh, movements and uh, something like expressive dance or five rhythms, you, you come up with full expression of whatever that that means to you whatever the music means whatever mm -hmm. the body wants to express and um, uh, when we're more versed in one we can get a little bit limited in what we call range and so how how did that um, benefit your life uh, exploring both the expressiveness and the form and discipline. Yeah, it was um, good to have both and I needed to have both. So still until now I need the dance and I need the yoga because both give me different things. And also to yoga became for me maybe more fluid or I, I integrate the dance in my yoga classes as well going from the asanas into dan into dance and finding your own space to express the asanas more like a poet mm. in a poetic way and not so static mm. oh, that sounds gorgeous <laughs> And then since, since then, or at least you, you do this now, you, uh, it sounds like you've brought even more of that expressiveness into your work. I know you've done stuff around sensuality, blossoming. Uh, I've seen you uh, advertise workshops with themes like that, helping people to fully blossom into their sensuality and things like laughter yoga. So can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, because I realized by the time and um, I worked as a coach for many years 
that often people come to me are kind of rigid, very disciplined and um, have more these control and they they uh, have a longing for letting go and joy and um, yeah, and I can give them these things and like through laughter, for example, um, this is a this has such a deep effect on you learn to let go, you learn to be more confident, you learn to to dive into the source of aliveness actually but it's not just the laughter it's the aliveness where are tears and crying and laughter and everything the emotions and also the dance um it frees something and for me yoga um is more and more about um yeah finding your your own practice like in my courses whatever i do i give the space to, that people can explore themselves the inner space in connection with the outer space mm. so because by the time i found it, it gets boring for me to tell people in a yoga class how to do this make your arm like this like this so <laughs> You know, this is not really yoga for me. It's about feel yourself and feel what's good for you and be creative and maybe find a new form. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I've always find it a bit ironic that uh, uh, traditionally yoga is, is a practice to uh, kind of achieve mental freedom, you know, free ourselves from limiting patterns and so on and then that the practice is often presented in in such a strict way like you have to put your foot exactly there at this angle um so uh yeah i can totally relate to that yeah and i think like yoga also comes from man it's created by yogis by men and men need something else they have different bodies mm. and i think now the what yoga what yoga is is changing also through women mm. it gets more fluid more creative yeah a bit like um i often think of uh, uh mr ayanga who was one of the first teachers to become very well known and teach trainers in the west and then one of his students randa scaravelli sort of picking up his teachings and, and really changing it to a much more sensual kind of personalized yeah. feminine approach if, if you like uh, yeah yeah so um uh, laughter as well um i often kind of when i have like a really good laugh with friends or i go and see a stand-up comedy show or something when you really have that like hysterical laughter it is so wonderful isn't it afterwards it's, yeah. it's like a particular type of relaxation i experience after that yes um, yeah it's the same way in the same way you totally relax and you energized you're fully alive and the same time fully relaxed and this this makes the laughter and like you say like a laughter fit when you can't control it, when it just comes to you and it shakes you, this is so super healthy. And like everybody has a longing for that. Mm -hmm. And, but people think, oh, you have to wait on, oh, they had this when they were a child and it's not coming again, but you can really train this. Mm -hmm. Like you can train the ability to laugh. So how, how, how do you do that? Because I think I'm one of these people that I don't even realize I need it until I do have a laugh, laugh to fit. And then I think, oh, that was great. I, I, I need more of that in my life. Yeah. How, how, how do you even begin? Do you have to be like funny? Are you a bit of a comedian in your classes? No, not at all. I'm not this type of person. And it's about, I call this laughter coaching or systemic laughter because I'm a systemic coach and I created together with my colleague in 2018, the Institute for Systemic Laughter, where we <laughs> use this. <laughs> right. 
we we integrate this as a tool in the coaching process because <clears throat> often also coaching is very serious and it's very a separation you are serious or you you laugh and when you laugh you don't take it serious but for me it's the same you know you need to laugh we need to have the humor and the laughter to uh, to survive all this you know also in the tra tragedy of life mm. yeah and, yeah yeah go on and um yeah the more you laugh the more you laugh like we have laughter muscles and often people they start to feel the muscles um, when they laugh they didn't they haven't been aware aware about this so you train these muscles but you also train the emotion of joy or the emotion of letting go so i use this as a micro practice so this means every day laugh for one or two or three minutes and if you don't feel like it, just make your mouth like this. Bring your mouth in a smile. Yeah. Because when we laugh one minute Very or longer, fun. then something happens in the brain. So the stress hormones go out, the happy hormones come in, the breath is deeper. So it brings all the fluid back to aliveness, actually. And so this is how you can train it. If you do this every day for a few minutes, then it will come to you more natural in real life. Yeah. And then also using laughter friends, for example, like there is a laughter chemical that you have a match in your laughter because the laughter is for me like a language. And um, there are some people you, you can just laugh at them crazy because um it's a fit it's a match and to use this like i have friends we just meet and laugh together so it's <laughs> it's, very, it's very normal that you say we meet to talk about problems but you can also meet to laugh together mm. yeah I, def I definitely have one or two friends i laugh with more and some, yeah, some people have a particularly infectious laugh, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize might be some kind of slightly personal match. Yeah. Yeah. How amazing. So to, to um, practice this, what, one minute laughter or whatever, three minutes laughter, um, if anyone listening would would like to to do that, do you recommend they maybe watch something funny on YouTube or? Um, uh, yeah, you yeah. can watch something funny, but you can also train to laugh without a reason, or to laugh with uh, with the opposite reason. This means um, you're standing in a traffic jam, and you tend to get angry, and then use this as a laughter praxis. So like if something happens where you like, ah, oh, then you also can laugh instead of producing stress hormones. Yeah. Oh. You can use anything, what helps you or under the shower or just when you clean your house or yeah. Well, that, that's really cool. I, I didn't really know that much about laughter yoga. So uh, uh, that's really wonderful. And it, it fits well i think with um concepts in in meditation that often come up in meditation of not taking ourselves so seriously and dropping a bit of ego um uh, which can be so stress reducing as well so i guess it it fits really well with that right yes yeah and you i don't know if you have this saying in english but in germany we say love yourself death and yes in dutch we certainly have it yeah i yeah. don't know about english but yeah I but i was thinking about why do you call it like this and then for me it's like you you um the ego dies like mm. when you have a laughter fit you're just in, totally in the present moment in your body and you cannot think anymore so there is no ego yeah so it's very laughter flashes, laughter fits. It's very similar, like orgasm. It's the same 
state where you totally um, lose the control and lose the ego in a way because you melt together with the present moment and you totally arrive in your body mm. yeah yeah and i i sometimes have this experience um oh if you know, i'm getting sort of too serious about something or maybe i'm a bit grumpy and stressed and um uh, someone who knows me well, like my partner or a, a close colleague, might be able to uh, kind of pierce that seriousness with a joke. And then I might have a moment of resisting, like, no, don't make me laugh. It's just really serious. <laughs> and then I can't help myself and start start laughing. And it ju it's just like every th that whole bubble of... Mm -hmm being overly serious and like, like controlling or whatever it is just bursts it's just yes gone yeah. yeah and this is also like you take a step back if you are really stuck in a problem like just taking a step back and laugh about this this is really helpful to be more relaxed and then work on this problem and this doesn't mean that we don't take the problem serious but um, we open the space for more relaxation also. Like mm -hmm. if you're stuck in a problem, you can't really do something because you're so stuck and your mind is stuck. You're not creative anymore in your thinking. And laughter also helps to open the space in the mind for creative thinking and for, yeah, it's a body movement also. Like if you laugh, like all your muscles are involved it's a massage yeah. from the inside so it's really physical and yeah. people are sometimes wondering that they start to sweat when they laugh <laughs> but this is really normal this is also detoxing yeah yeah and um, i think i i was trying to remember the last last time i laughed a lot it, it yeah was when was the last time for you <laughs> I definitely laugh a lot um, when we run our in-person courses, like like the Embodied Facilitator course you came on. We we have very funny staff meetings because um, it's one of our ways of yeah staying open, creative, and reducing stress. So there'll usually be quite a few instances in a day where we laugh a lot. Uh, to the point where I can feel my core muscles ache, you know, and yeah. my face aches. Yeah. Um, and also with, uh, yeah, with my granddaughter, who's two, who's just hilarious a lot of the times. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's good to, to give the laughter space. Like normally in social life, we laugh a bit and then we tend to stop this. Um, so we do the same with crying mm. and like to make space where you really let this go let this flow and maybe it stops and then you come back into it like um, and crying and laughter is very close together like in my workshops it often happens that people also start to cry and this is so good because um, it comes from the same source and it's a release of something that is stuck. And yeah, this is this is also my work to open this the space of aliveness. Whereas all emotions, not just the laughter or the like let's say the superficial laughter, it's very deep. It's a very deep work. Mm. Yeah, I can I can imagine also um it may, you know, maybe the listeners reflected there as well. When was the last time I had that really like deep belly laugh? It can be a bit sad, maybe realizing we haven't laughed like that for a while, or mm. and there's not enough of that in our lives. Yeah, could open up uh, quite a lot for people. Also, the the topic of shame, like in laughter workshops, also the there's a lot of shame for people. Like we all have these experience 
that to be loved at, I don't know if this is the right English, but as Charles, mm. people laugh about you, or there's also not just nice laughter. Mm. And we all have these experience. And that's why also like the issue of shame comes up and mm. all the or fear or whatever and uh, yeah the the emotions and it's a space to work with emo with all deep emotions yeah yeah i like i like the um idea as well it seems a bit of a contradiction in terms of the systemic laughter because <laughs> in my head it's like laughter is more of a spontaneous thing yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, yeah i explained the systemic laughter means we laugh ourselves out of the system okay cool yeah in different senses out of the stuck body system and into a system of community also because there's the bonding effect of laughter it's very important for bonding and a team or a group and like we love ourselves also into the system of community mm. so like you yeah this is the meaning of systemic yeah and oh yeah i was thinking as well it would be harder to laugh by myself if i didn't have some stimulation like watching something or listening to a, a joke um because it is definitely something I associate with being with others generally. Yeah, but for the training, it's very good to, to laugh alone, um, to, to explore your character of laughter. Because yeah. like this is a character and we really don't know all uh, parts of this character. So and to explore this, like the sounds, the... What is the body doing while we laugh, actually? There is an embodiment of laughter. And normally we don't know what the body is doing when we laugh or which body parts are included, which body parts are stuck. Some people just laugh with the head or is the whole body involved too? And this is an exploration. So in my workshops, we explore the embodiment of laughter. And for this, it's good to have your own space. Um, and also like a meditation, laugh alone and play with the laughter and, and explore it. Mm. Well, I shall definitely have a, have a go. Yeah. And maybe if you start this, you feel a bit stupid. <laughs> but then the more you do it, the more normal it gets. And then it's for me, it's very important to laugh about myself. And this happens very often for me. I sit alone, I work, and then I start to laugh about something about myself. And um, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine feeling a bit self-conscious doing it by myself, which is kind of silly. <laughs> <laughs> you get used to this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It just, feels just normal. And then it's so interesting because you get to know more um more facets of your laughter more mm. vibrations more sounds more and this is a huge character like and we maybe know just the little social part of this mm. so you basically i don't know whatever sit somewhere or you said in the shower and start smiling and then have a bit of a giggle <laughs> It's just just like that and so just I'm, like a, yeah, yeah i just i did this just before this interview here <laughs> <laughs> brilliant yeah oh, oh i am smiling a lot for uh, people that are um just just listening to the podcast definitely smiling a lot during this conversation <laughs> i remember me when i first uh, met you and this is very very stereotypical typing of me terrible please uh, excuse me but I thought you were a very very smiley for a German person because <laughs> sometimes German people can can have that embodiment of seriousness 
That's uh, true, yeah. Apologies to German listeners for the stereotyping. But I did notice you had a wonderful, warm smile on your face a lot of the time. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well practiced. Yeah, but also, um, this was also in my family. Like, I, like you learn also the, the ability of laughter through your parents. Like if you have a lot of laugh, laughter at home or parents, then it's much easier for you. Mm. Um, and I had both sides in my home, like uh, a very serious um, side on also the laughter. I would say also I am, I have a very serious side inside myself, but I always had by nature this laughter, which uh, was so good for any survival of dark parts. Yeah. Uh, it helped me a lot. And it helped me also to have more confidence because if you're shy, laughter can help you to have more confidence and be more, uh, show yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and um, also linking it to, to language and, and cultural embodiment. Um, I'm from, from the Netherlands, so I've lived in the UK a long time, and uh, English people have a particular sense of humour. Um, I'm good at satire, for example. Um, and I, I remember when I first moved here, I spoke English very well, really, because I already done quite a lot of university level studying in English but the one of the things I found really hard was to understand some of the humor here and and to to be funny in another language I found it much easier to crack jokes in Dutch initially than I did in English so there's a whole kind of cultural and language embodiment to, to being funny as well as laughter so it, it's it's can be very multi-layered i think just like any type of embodiment it's got all these different yeah levels yeah there is a kind of embodiment of humor and embodiment of laughter yeah i realized because i spend a lot of time in england as well and uh, i realized that English people in general are more smiling or more friendly than Germans. But if it comes to letting go control and uh, letting themselves fall into these laughter fits, that's easier for German people. Mm. Well, that, that's so interesting, isn't it? And I think similarly in the Netherlands, we, you know, we do have a sense of humor, but it's it's probably also, also relatively controlled in lots of ways or very sort of contextualized like it's okay in this context mm. and not so okay in another yeah yeah and uh, it's okay when you drink for example this alcohol thing then oh, you're yeah. allowed or for children it's allowed but yeah. yeah and it's also the fear of losing authority I guess especially for men like if you let yourself go in laughter, then people think you might, you're crazy or they don't take you serious so much anymore. You lose authority. That's yes. why maybe in general, it's more easy for women. Yeah, like in general, men tell the jokes and women start giggling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. And I really I noticed it as well with uh, children, with, for example, with my toddler granddaughter um, she can be really funny sometimes when she gets angry you know she has a tantrum and it's actually really funny but because I need to set some boundary I have to stop myself laughing because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still want her to you know to eat something or whatever I want her to do yeah uh, it's yeah so kind of stopping myself um yeah recognize that in relation to maintaining my authority yeah yeah <laughs> two-year-old <laughs> ah yeah so um uh, going back a bit to some of the other 
parts of your work, this kind of romantic poetry part, nature connection, sensuality, um, and uh, maybe a kind of devotional side to the yoga practice um, uh, in that. Uh, could you say a bit more about how that comes into your work? Yeah, so sensuality for me is um, connected to the senses and there is a central sensuality apart from sexuality often it's it's people think that's one but sensuality for me means connecting to the senses open your senses and the senses bring you really into the present moment into your body and the same time into the space beyond the body like like um the same time they connect you with the world and the spirituality yeah and this devotion for me means we don't have anything under control often in the spiritual world like we are creators but there is also like a greater power and to open the space for this and to receive and see what's happening when I receive uh, this, <clears throat> this is for me devotion. And instead of thinking I can control anything, I feel not good, I'm not healthy, so I just have to work harder. So we often have this concept. And sometimes it's just to be with what is and receive maybe the greater plan or step into what actually is the greater plan if I let go of my plans. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, bigger, the bigger picture. And for this, like nature and poetry helps me a lot. Like I, I walk a lot in the nature and I really like to walk also alone to receive and connect with this greater space or the nature or like writing painting making some arts then you connect with uh, the greater space when i write for example the best thing is just i i become like a space where the words flow through me and i don't do them or it's maybe other words than the ones i planned mm. yeah yeah, and I, I think this oft, it often really helps me um, if if I do feel stuck or down uh, in some way, a bit depressed, that to to go outside and like look at the sky, especially at night, if I can see some stars. And looked at the the full moon last night, for example. It 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 actually gives me that that bigger perspective, unbelievable size mm. and magic of the universe. Um, so na nature connection really helps me with that. And from, from what you said about devotion as well, it's, it almost sounds to me like a positive, like a more positive form of surrender. Like I sometimes have this association with surrender of how oh, I just, I just give up I give myself up but almost yeah in that way of uh, I can't fight anymore so I surrender like a soldier might yeah but for me surrender is something also really active it's not passive and not just oh now whatever happens happens it's more like being receptive to mm. what is and being in acceptance but not passive mm. yeah i yeah. like that especially in the, linking it to devotion in that way really uh, it's really interesting to me i'm going to think about that a bit more mm. Okay. Mm. and also yeah in the yoga or if you do body movement or embodiment to see what comes from a greater space and what 
like sometimes you can be surprised how you move or what's moving you through the music. Music, for example, is also very important for me because art and mm. let this happen. This is surrender for me. And it's not passive because I need to be very awake and very receptive. And then this greater power can flow through me and create this piece of art with the body in the space. Mm. That sounds very wonderful um, and uh, really useful, I think, in, uh, in the world to, to have these, these moments of connection. And as yoga is so often a meditation, yoga and meditation, both um, described as a way of becoming one, with the universe language like that and it's it's often seems so hard to uh, give some kind of practice to to achieve that there's a sense of well if you do all these practices you follow this path it will spontaneously happen but some some of the things you said give actually some lovely ways of um, putting conditions in place to feel a bit more at, at one with the universe. Mm. Yeah, and also with the, with the seasons, with, we're also very disconnected from the seasons or the nature. Like we want to be the same effective and doing the same things all, the, all year through. But we have the seasons, not just in the world, but also inside the body. And this has also something to do with surrender for me to listen to this, like the seasons mm. inside, the cycles inside, in communication with the seasons outside. It's always like a creative communication. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with that myself quite a lot as well and still my default um, mode is often to to push against it you know to push through being tired or um, say yes to too many things mm. uh, during the winter months um, so how do you navigate that because you you're doing quite a lot as well it looks like from your <laughs> website so how do you balance the that responsiveness to cycles with the busy demands of most of um, our lives i always check that i have enough time for my own i need alone time and time in the nature so i try to go every day for example for a walk and make space for this so and my body naturally tells me so that I really do a lot of things. And also right now I'm very busy, but um, that I have this voice inside my body that tells me stop now. So I, in a way I can't cross too many borders because my body will step in between and <laughs> tell me now it's time to um, go in the nature or be alone for a moment. Mm. And I also use micro practices. This means like little, little practices, one, two, three minutes practices that I spread out all over the day, like little stars. Like if you have don't have time for a longer practice, then these micro practices are really helpful. Mm. Like for example, um, being grateful for a minute, being grateful for anything that is there in the life. Or, yeah, the laughter, as we already said. Or um, shaking the body, put one song on every day and dance just for one song. And all these little things are really helpful as well. Yeah, we can all hopefully find um, one minute, right? To uh... Yeah. I mean, imagine how many minutes do we spend on the phone and surfing around and wasting time or stuck in the mind so we can use these many minutes for 
moving the body and it's always through the body like the moment you do something with your body like it changes the, the system mm. or yes. just be for a minute aware of what's actually happening in my body right now mm. yeah and be okay with this yeah i mean sometimes we don't have to do anything about it we just have to be aware that's there and that's fine good days sad days like not always i think we tend to always try to do something about it or change it but sometimes it's just good to be with it and it's fine mm. yeah absolutely I'm doing just now kind of checking in with my body <laughs> and ah, relaxing a little bit more ah so you've also got um, um, uh, your own uh, podcast uh, I mentioned in the introduction. Did it start last year? Did I get that right? Yes, this is a podcast I do together with the German yoga magazine. It started in December. And like every month we have a theme. In December was it, was it was the magic of the darkness. In January, it's the magic of playfulness. Mm. Then we get into, into the magic of um, love, being alone and community around these um, themes. Mm. And it's a mix of sometimes I give micro practices, then I have interviews with the people. So, and it is in German language. Yeah, that might be wonderful for some of our listeners. It's uh, called the Ananda podcast. So uh, um, if you Google that, uh, it will come up, I reckon. Yeah, if you give Ananda and maybe my name or maybe just Ananda, I guess it's enough on Apple podcast and Spotify, you will find it. Yeah. Lovely. Um, uh, yeah, what else have you got uh, kind of that you teach regularly that people might uh, will obviously share your, your website? So um, in, in Berlin, I have live courses in systemic laughter workshops and courses. I teach yin yoga and intuitive yoga classes. And all online, I do the laughter circle. This is like a mini retreat, like eight weeks. We are together in one group and in a micro form. So one time a week, 45 minutes to, yeah, to connect with this laughter and laugh together. And I do other mini retreats connected to the cycles of nature. And um, in this mini retreat, you get also micro practices from me in, in form of audios. And sometimes we meet together to have a sharing. Oh, wonderful. Because I know, uh, like many of us, you, you are doing a lot of these things uh, online. Uh, so people can access it. And uh, Julia's website, SenseWise, Dot de the link will be uh, in the, the podcast descriptions on all our different media yeah and this uh, website has also an english version like yeah. you automatically uh, come to the english version if you come from another other another country or you click on the button english yeah yeah brilliant i, I found it quite easy to have to find that so that's all really great and um, yeah, as we sort of approach the end of our time together, do you have any particular embodiment tip you would like to share with our um, listeners? You've already shared a few really great ones. Anything else you would like to add? So I add one micro practice. If you are in stress and you think you don't have time, for one minute, walk or do anything you do in slow motion. Oh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do with that this week, I'm sure. So, 
Wonderful. Uh, so yeah, all the info will be shared. Um, uh, uh, all Julia's info you can find via the links and uh, hopefully you can enjoy some of her suggestions having one minute of slow motion movement or walking one minute of dancing to your favorite music practice laughing and uh, get into some of these great ideas that she shared in an experiential way so thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, yeah, thank and, you uh, so much. And uh, making me smile a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much.